1970, Encinitas, California, five o'clock in the evening. My sister walks in the room and says, Terry, grab everything you own. We have to go right now. Where are we going? We're going to dad's house. Dad's house? He doesn't know we're coming. I know, but we have to leave right now. It's not safe for us. We have to go before mom gets home. Debbie, I can't go. I just can't go. Terry, you, we have to go now. Mom and her boyfriend Jerry have been drinking all day, and they are drunk, and it is dangerous. Let's go now. OK, all right, but I don't have a bag or a suitcase or anything. What do I bring? Here, take this pillowcase and whatever you can fit in it, take that. We got to go now. OK, all right. But Debbie, what about my goldfish? Who's going to take care of them? Can we take them? No, Terry, we can't take the goldfish. They'll be OK. We need to leave right now. We walked 30 minutes to my dad's house and never returned. So I'm eight years old and my sister 13. We took our lives in our own hands, and we moved into my dad's bachelor pad, where he gave us love. And he cooked us a rotation of tuna casserole, lentil soup, and veggie links. <laughs> but we felt safe. Little did I know what Debbie and I did required great courage. When I looked back, all I saw was two little girls running away. In fact, the majority of my life, I have been insecure and afraid and embarrassed from my life and my story. And it wasn't until I became a life coach that I became curious and I started to admire my coaching clients. And I noticed that they demonstrated a lot of courage, but they never saw it in themselves. And I knew I had to know more about this subject. It compelled me to write a book about courage. And it wasn't until I wrote that book that somebody asked me for examples of my own courage. And I started to reflect on my life and my life stories. And I realized I was courageous too. And it changed my life. So what I want everyone to know is that it's important to have courage. And only when we can have courage can we really fulfill our true potential, and inspire others around us to do the same. And today, it's my intention to teach you how to identify and enhance your own courage so that you can face the most daunting challenges with grace and strength, and inspire others around you to do the same. After I discovered that I was courageous, I realized I had done four things that empowered me to find the fortitude and grit to get through some of the worst moments of my life. And I've committed myself to sharing those four things with my coaching clients and audiences worldwide. And today, you're going to hear my story and the four steps that I took and you're going to craft an action plan. And when our time is over today, you'll be empowered to achieve new levels of personal and professional success. So back to the story. When Debbie and I moved in with my dad, he wasn't exactly prepared for us. 
He had a small bachelor pad and not much room. But he made it work. My dad grew up in the beautiful state of Utah and moved to Southern California to finish his psychology, de psychology degree at the age of 25. He enjoyed the experiences of Southern California that were vastly different from where he grew up. He and my mom were married about six years, and they were introduced to drinking, smoking, and partying. My parents eventually got divorced when I was eight years old. Mom kept drinking, and Dad moved on to studying Eastern philosophy and hang out with gurus in India for weeks at a time. <laughs> he had a long beard, long hair, wore puka shells. Anybody know what that is? <laughs> and he had some unusual interest in the latest New Age fads that came along. And one in particular I was not exactly aware of. So six years later, after my parents got divorced, I'm still living with Dad and my older sister, Debbie. And Dad decides that we're going to go on a family vacation to some hot springs in the mountains of Northern California. My older sister did not want to go. So my dad and his girlfriend and I get in the old yellow Toyota pickup with that big white camper on it. Yeah, and we head to the mountains in Northern California. We're driving about 12 hours, and then my dad says, we're here. I'm so excited. I'm in the back of the camper, and I throw open the drapes, and I'm looking outside, and I see these beautiful mountaintops and these tall pine trees. I could smell the fresh air. Oh, I could even smell the pine needles. And there was a steam coming out of this huge pool. And as I looked a little closer, I saw naked people. <laughs> Older naked people. Everywhere. My dad had told me he had gone to a nudist colony before, but he never took me. And he certainly didn't tell me that's where we're going on our family vacation. <laughs> when I realized where we were, I said, Dad, how dare you? How dare you take me here? You expect me to stay here all week? I'm not taking my clothes off. Take me home right now. <laughs> ah, Terry, this place is fun. You're going to have a great time. These people are really nice. If you don't take me home right now, I'm going to stay in the camper the entire week. Just bring me food. The camper is big enough to sleep in, and it had a bathroom. So I refused to get out, and my dad and his girlfriend left. So there I am. A couple hours later, it's getting dark, and I'm getting hungry. And I'm wondering if they're going to come back and bring me some food. And then there's a knock on the door. I open the door, thinking it's my dad, and it's a boy, my age, and he's cute, <laughs> and he has clothes on. <laughs> Who are you? I'm John. Your parents told me to come and try to get you out of the camper and tell you this place is so bad. He had been there for a couple weeks and was okay with the nudism because he was used to it from his parents doing it for a long time, but he never took his clothes off. We talked for about an hour, and I said, you know, I just need a little time. Thank you for coming, and he left. He came back an hour later and asked if I wanted to go to the cafeteria at the retreat. I was starving, so I left. We ended up becoming friends and hanging out the entire week with our clothes on. <laughs> I loved my dad, but I did not go along with his agenda. When we say no to people around us, it takes courage. And our courage is really put to the test. When we're asked to do something or put in a position that violates our values or our dignity, The problem is, when we say no to people in our personal and professional life, 
we risk losing their esteem, their love, their respect, and even our position at work. But if we don't stand up for ourselves, we love and respect ourselves less and will likely continue degrading ourselves and our work. When we do say no with grace and strength, we enhance our courage, our confidence, our pride, and we're empowered to take risks. And we inspire others around us to have that confidence and trust in us. And that trust and confidence in the long run will result in being given greater respect and opportunities. When we act with courage and communicate with grace and strength, we enhance our stature, our reputation, and our influence. And ultimately, we will create the life, workplace, and world that we all want. So take action step number one and enhance your courage and inspire others. When asked to compromise, just say no. I'm gonna have you answer a question to the, the handout that you just received for the step number one. So everybody get their handouts and I want you to just take a couple minutes and answer question number one. 1994, August, Salt Lake City, Utah. I work, I'm working in an eye clinic in a surgery center. And on this day, Dr. Lewis did something I had never seen before. He called me up to the operating room where he came out completely sterile with his gloves and mask on. And in the five years I'd worked for him, I'd never seen him do anything like that before. Dr. Lewis was a very famous eye surgeon. He had a Learjet and he would fly patients in from the surrounding states to perform eye surgery and then fly them back. I could see despite his mask that his face was red and he was mad. He said, Terry, how come you have not fired Emily? I told you to fire her. I couldn't do it. Terry, she called in sick two days in a row and now I'm behind on all my patients because of it. You need to fire her now. Dr. Lewis, you can't fire someone just because they called in sick. This is the first time Emily has called in sick an entire year. Terry, she called in last minute two days in a row. I have 20 surgeries today, and now I'm two hours behind, and I need to fly these patients back at four o'clock. Fire her, or I will find someone else to. I knew Emily was a single mom of four children under the age of 10. She was a dedicated employee, and she needed this job. I said, Dr. Lewis, I am not going to fire her, and I'm not going to ask someone else to. Fire yourself or find someone else. I walked out downstairs towards my office, and I was thinking, what have I done? Even though I wouldn't knew I would be next to be fired? I said no. I found the courage I didn't even know I had that gave me the confidence to stand up for my own values. So on the ne next break, I went into my office and I started calling the local pharmaceutical reps to see if they had a position available. <laughs> and they did. But there was a problem. The problem was, for every pharmaceutical rep position available, a college degree was required. I always wanted to be a chiropractor or a physical therapist, and I loved medicine and biology but I didn't have a degree. 
So I always wanted to be a pharmaceutical rep, so I applied for the position. And they called me in for an interview. I was in the interview for about three hours, and the conversation was going great. I even thought, I think I might have the job. And then the interviewer said, Terry, let's see, I have one last question for you. I see that you went to college for a couple years. Now, what degree did you get? Um, I didn't get a degree. I didn't finish college. I could see the disappointment in his face. Terry, our company requires a college degree. I don't care if it's in basket weaving. Any degree will do. And then there was a long pause. And then he said, Terry, you come so highly recommended. I'm going to go up the line and see if there's anything we can do to make an exception. What I didn't know then is that they had never hired a woman representative in my area before. I knew ophthalmology and I knew their products. I didn't see any reason why I would not do well. So, a few days go by and I don't hear from them. And then the day before Christmas, I get a phone call and it's the interviewer. Terry, what are you doing January 5th? Uh, I don't know. I don't have any plans. How would you like to come to our national sales meeting in Hawaii? What do you think I said? <laughs> yes. He told me they had never made an exception like this before, but they were willing to take a risk on me. And I got the job. I did not disqualify myself. I found confidence in my interview I didn't even know I had. I worked for them for four years, and I enjoyed every minute of it. They were willing to overlook the fact that I missed or didn't have a very important qualification for their company, and they were willing to give me a job as the first pharmaceutical representative without a college degree, and the first woman representative in our area. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> Had I disqualified myself, I would have risked missing the opportunity of achieving my dream of becoming a pharmaceutical rep. Give yourself a chance, even if the odds are against you. Don't believe in the thinking that you aren't qualified or you don't meet your own expectations or the un other expectations of other people. We can only achieve great things if we're willing to take a risk and fail. Start step by step with a commitment to keep going no matter what. And this really is the path to fulfilling our true potential. No more delays. Commit to not missing the opportunity out of fear. Be willing to stumble. And your success rate in life and work will soar. When you show your courage, you show up in a way that captures people's attention. And when the odds are against you, show them what you're made of. Don't disqualify yourself. Trust in what you're capable of achieving. Get in the game. Act the part. And show them the courage that will get you in the door. Enhance your courage and inspire others. And take action step number two. Never disqualify yourself. So just take a couple minutes and answer question number two. 2012, August, Park City, Utah.
Starbucks, late morning. I'm having coffee with my friend Colleen, and I'm telling her, Colleen, I have coached hundreds of clients over the past 15 years, and there's something that I just don't understand. What's that, Terry? I've noticed that most of my co coaching clients demonstrate amazing courage, but they don't see it in themselves, especially women. Wow, Terry, that is amazing. You should write a book about that. Write a book. A book? I don't even know how to write. I can't write a book, no. Mm -mm. Then the caffeine kicked in. And we came up with another brilliant idea. A survey on the subject of courage for women. I posted the survey online and I started to receive responses back from all walks of life. Mothers, daughters, sisters, business owners, entrepreneurs, artists, and again, I was astounded by the courage they demonstrated, but never saw in themselves. In fact, the majority of women hesitated to fill out the survey because they never saw themselves as courageous. But they were. There was one story of a young mother who tragically lost her, children, her husband in a plane crash, leaving her to raise her four small children alone. And another woman nursed two of her daughters through breast cancer. One survived, and the other one not so lucky. And another woman's son disappears without a trace, never to be seen again. Story after story, I saw how these women found the strength to overcome obstacles and unimaginable tragedy and heartbreak and pain as if they had no other choice. But what I saw is that they did have a choice because they kept going and they didn't give up. to tell these women how inspiring and courageous they were. I wanted to tell them that they can let go of that shame and blame from the past and they can start to celebrate the courage they have shown in the battles of their lives instead. After my book was published, I started speaking to groups around the country. And I started noticing how they were letting go of the shame and blame, and they were celebrating their courage instead. And they told me when they started to own their own courage, they were able to take risk and achieve things they never dreamed possible. And they started inspiring people around them to do the same. I discovered that courage is contagious. And I realized, when we give ourselves credit for being courageous, we start to fulfill our true potential. And we inspire others around us to contribute at our, their highest level. How cool is that? As I continued to travel around the country sharing these surveys and the book that came from these surveys, 100 Hearts, something amazing happened. I was giving a presentation to a group of women, and there I am on stage, and one of the ladies asked me for examples of my own courage. My head started to spin, my heart started to pound, and I was completely taken back. My own courage. What do I say? I was terrified. I gave a very inadequate answer. I said, I find courage in my day-to-day -day life. <laughs> 
I ran off the stage. I was so embarrassed. I went home and I started thinking about it. And I thought about growing up with an alcoholic mother, running away from home at the age of eight, the nudist camp, saying no to Dr. Lewis, and getting a job as a pharmaceutical rep without a college degree and many other instances. I never saw the courage in my life stories. I just saw someone that was afraid and embarrassed from them. I saw everything that I had done as expedient survival strategies. Nothing to be proud of. I was just like the women in the survey. I never in my wildest dreams thought I'd ever demonstrated any courage in my own life. And I wrote a book about it. <laughs> they say you teach what you need to learn. I never saw in myself what I was telling everybody else to do. And then I asked myself, what if I could really see myself as courageous? It took me a good year. And when I finally owned the idea, I stopped hiding my past. And I started to show up in a big way in life. And I started to achieve things I never imagined. And I wanted and continue to share the message that we all have courage. We just have to acknowledge it. I went from seeing myself as embarrassed and afraid to seeing myself as strong and courageous. And now I see every risk as an opportunity to go for it. And my life and career are soaring. We all need to acknowledge the courage we've already demonstrated. When we acknowledge our courage, and share our stories, we show up in a way that captures people's attention. And we have a confidence and charisma that makes people want to be around us. When you start to share your story of how you've demonstrated courage, it will not only empower you, but it'll inspire everyone around you to do the same. Courage is contagious. Enhance your courage and inspire others. And take action step number three. Share your story. All right, take just a couple more minutes and answer question number three. 2017. Park City, Utah. October, early morning. I pick up the phone to make a phone call I'd been con contemplating making for many years. It was a different phone call than I'd ever made before. My mom picks up the phone and I say, Mom, I miss you. And there's something I want to tell you. Mom, you know how I wrote that book about courage and I didn't think I had any? And then I realized I did and how it changed my life? Mom, I need you to know how courageous you've been in your life. I know it took a lot of courage for you to keep going when you lost your children because of your alcoholism. And mom, it showed so much courage for you to overcome your addiction and go back to school to become a registered nurse so that you could be there for your sick husband, Jerry, and my little brother, John. Mom, you kept going after Jerry passed away. 
so that you could be there for all of us. Mom, are you there? Mom, I could hear the emotion in her voice as she answered. Terry, thank you. Thank you so much. That means so much to me. Mom, you need to know that I love you and I'm so happy that you're my mother. I admire you so much. And you are my inspiration. So let me ask you, whose courage do you need to acknowledge? Who has inspired you that you need to have a conversation with? It's time to keep our admiration not to ourselves anymore. We need to honor the courage in everyone around us. When we honor the courage in each other, it inspires us all to show up and fulfill our true potential. Commit to honoring everyone around you. And if every one of you did that every day, can you even imagine what we would accomplish? Enhance your courage and inspire others and take action step number four. Honor the courage in others. Take two minutes and answer the last question, number four. You've all achieved great things and taken risks, but you can do more. Commit to taking these four steps today. When asked to compromise, say no. Never disqualify yourself. Share your stories. And honor the courage in others. The time to act is now. Commit to embracing our courage together so that we can all fulfill our true potential and create the life, the world, and even the workplace that we've all been dreaming of. Thank you very much. for being here. It has been very, very emotional for me to speak to all, so many friends and people that I know in my community. It's different when you're speaking to people you don't really know. So I really appreciate it. It means the world to me and I love every one of you, even the people I don't know with those beautiful faces and smiling you know, at, back at me with the admiration. I so appreciate it. And this is our inaugural PC Talk, so I hope that you join our other events. Uh, it's, it's exciting for us to bring really quality events to our community and back to Main Street. And Scott, is Scott here still? Scott, Thomas, thank you so much for allowing us to give you know, this talk tonight to all these women. I hope that you're all inspired, and I hope that you can take something with you and start today and really make some changes in your own life and other people's lives.